I'm Jonathan Weintraub, co-founder of Space.io. Stay tuned for Taped with Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Danny, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk Hello about and welcome that. to Taped with Rabbi Doug. We are here in Skokie, Illinois today with Yonatan Weintraub, who's here from Israel. He is one of the three co-founders of Space IL, and it's an incredible organization because for those of you who might not be familiar, Space IL is a private organization um, which is supported by in many ways, the Israel government, because they supported this private organization in their actions and what they were doing, as did the whole entire country of Israel and Jewish people around the world in sending the first private mission of a spacecraft to the moon. And they built this spacecraft, they went through the whole thing, and it did make it to the moon, but we'll talk about that on the way. Welcome to the show, and uh, Baruch Haba, welcome to Chicago area. And, and being here, uh, we met the first time actually in Washington, D.C., uh, where he was telling us about uh, their mission. And now here in Chicago, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Tell us, first of all, um, what is your background? What did you do that you got into space exploration and building spaceships? Yeah, so uh, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to build uh, rocket ships and spacecrafts. And I was uh, uh, working with Legos at the time, but then I kind of evolved this hobby into a profession. I was working as a satellite system engineer at the Israeli Aerospace Industries. This is the, com the, the, uh, eight, the company that makes the satellites in Israel. I was at NASA Ames for a, a, a kind of semester to learn about how can we colonize Mars. Um, and so I was in the space industry ever since I remember myself uh, having a lot of fun with it. Did you make those little rocket ships that with with uh, baking soda and things like that that shot up into the air when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty much all about that. I uh, tried to take matches and use that as propellant as well, oh. and so that was that was a lot of fun growing up. Very, very cool, very cool. So, you you did all these things and you learned. Where did you study? Um, so I have a master's in electrical engineering and neuroscience from Tel Aviv University, mm -hmm. and I'm now doing a PhD at uh, Stanford University. Oh, very nice. In uh, biophysics. Very nice. Yeah, uh, got to meet uh, the two co-founders, mm -hmm. uh, Yariv and Kfir, in a kind of a on conference in a, some sort of sort of a conference that you come in and everybody makes something, and uh, we get introduced by a mutual friend that said, "You guys are crazy enough. You should meet each other." And both of us uh, kind of clicked, and we kind of start hanging out, thinking about what uh, we should do together. So really, the three of you collaborated from the very beginning. Yeah. And uh, so we thought about what we should do, and then uh, Yariv calls me up and said, you know, I have a great idea, uh, I want to do this, uh, have you heard of the competition organized by Google to send a robotic mission to the moon? And I said, of course I heard about it, I've been looking for an opportunity to do that for some time. We set out in a bar, and the rest is history, as they say. Wow, wow, wow. So, in, in, a, in a mission like this, certainly even as a, uh, uh, a thought, before you ever do anything, you have to think about not only the uh, technical and scientific uh, ramifications of building such a thing, but you also have to think of the financial ramifications of building such a thing. How do you raise money? This would a hundred million dollars. This cost this project. Yeah, yeah. The, the cost of the project is a little shy of hundred million dollars. Uh, we were actually at the very beginning. We were working and trying to figure out how can we do this mission. And uh, we were offered to speak in a conference by uh, Professor Itzik Ben Israel, which is the head of the Israeli Space Agency. He said, you should come to this conference. I'm organizing a conference, great crowd. You should prepare to give your talk. And we had seven minutes. And those seven minutes, by the way, are still on YouTube. Uh -huh. And so he kind of hinted that it's, it's important that we will do a good job in that conference. So I remember sitting over the slides and looking at what, what we need to be doing. And we had seven minutes. We went on stage. We came down. And this lovely person comes up to us and says, do you have any money? And everybody are looking at fear, looking at your looking at fear. I mean, we just got started. We barely own a car. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know what? Come to my office. I'll give you $100,000. And that person was Morris Kahn, and which is a great benefactor of this mission. And he donated eventually 40 something million dollars. So that was wow. uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, a great deal of it. Um, yeah. So 
raising the rest of the money? How did they come about? Did they come from private sources mainly? Yeah, so for, uh, so the, the, as I mentioned, we started as part of the competition organized mm -hmm. by Google, and one of the rules of the competition is the government cannot support more than 10% of the mission. They wanted to do a space, private space exploration mission. And so the government did not allocate a lot of money to this project, so it was primarily from donors, manufacturers, um, that gave the, the, most of the sum for this mission. But we had, what I'm really happy is that we had donors that are all the way from uh, people that are able financially to provide a lot of funds, but also kids to giving their bar mitzvah allowance to Space AL, uh, which I think it's, it's very important because these kids get to follow the mission. They obviously got stickers and pins for their, uh -huh. for their donation. But also, you know, the engineers know that what they're working on really matters to that particular bar mitzvah boy uh, about this mission. Now, the engineers that got involved with the three of you in designing and building uh, the architects of the of the spacecraft, um, were, did they have? Are they all people who had space experience before? So we were basically from the very beginning. We were joined forces with Israeli Aerospace Industries mm -hmm. (IAI), which is also where I used to work as a satellite system right. engineer. And they kind that's, of that's really a, a, mainly a military uh, organization. It's not, a, it's not a military, but it's a, it's a defense contract. They, they're defense contractors for the military. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they built all the satellites for Israel, and they have the specialties. And and so I'm really glad that my boss's boss, the head of the managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and II was in the space division was able to kind of say yes we're going to help you we're going to join forces and his processors uh, uh, did that as well so it ended up to be a very good collaboration with Israeli aerospace industries and space AL and together we built it so space AL got the enthusiasm the uh, the agile planning and how to do this and our engineering forces with alongside with II was working like shoulder to shoulder neck to neck. To, to make this a reality, and you know that I well, give the credit to Offer the Ron, which was the the head of the space uh, division of IEI, and and Ido Antebi, uh, which is the CEO of Space IL, they were working together to make this mission. Reality. So this space module that you built to land on the moon was really uh, uh, about 350 pounds only, but w with the fuel loaded in it, it was a little over a thousand pounds. Uh, it, it's small per se. It was it was a small unit. What did it have the capabilities of doing uh, if it was to land the way it was supposed to? So uh, first of all, this is um, I think the greatest value of this mission is a technology demonstrator. Mm -hmm. uh, up to this point, uh, no organization, country or not, have ever done anything similar to this. Uh, it, Space AL or Bereshit is the smallest spacecraft ever built and launched for lunar landing. Mm -hmm. And it's um, um, by far the most sophisticated one, I think. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we did is we proved that you can do this in a private manner. So up, up until last Passover, until April, mm -hmm. only superpowers have landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. Starting April, private organizations can do that. And, and you're the first. And we're the first. Uh, we landed in too many pieces. We still um, need to work on that part to land one piece. Well, it was a, it was a hard landing because uh, how I understand it is just before landing, I mean literally seconds before landing, uh, you lost communication with the spacecraft. But to that point, all the pictures and everything until right before landing, everything was perfect until that point. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and what, there was a there was a, a bad module. There was a module that failed or something that was going on. That was part of the problem. Right? Yeah, there's uh, there's a. A sequence of events, it's too complicated yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. Uh, do this uh, right now, but it was a sequence of events that basically uh, caused this uh, loss of communication. But that you got it to the moon and it landed on the moon to begin with, whether it was a hard landing or a soft landing, is still a great accomplishment in history. Yeah, thank you, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that uh, the fact that we were able to do this miniaturized technology and it's all region in Israel is, is a great, great deal part of it. And I think that the future missions uh, by other organizations are going to follow. You can see NASA quotes now that they want to do private lunar missions for $100 million. Why did they quote that number from? They took the same number as we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we used some new technology that was developed in Israel by very smart people about uh, using commercial off-the-shelf components. Even the trajectory that we took to the moon was considered brand new and was never attempted before doing a ride-sharing launch mm -hmm. with another satellite to save costs. So we basically do, did the Uber of space travel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, riding the share, with, sharing the ride with another satellites. And uh, so all that is kind of new and this is, was a main factor in bringing the cost down. And I'm hoping that many more missions around the world will be able to do that and even one day we can all go. Yeah, that's so cool. So the launching which took place uh, took place actually in Florida on, on NASA's property, is that correct? Yeah, Cape Canaveral. At Cape, Cape Canaveral. That was because 
you did not have the rocket power or ability with the neighbors around Israel to set up such a thing in Israel for the launching without there being ramifications. Is that true? So one, one key aspect, this is an amazing aspect about Israeli space technology, which is not very well known, is that Israel makes the most weight efficient satellites in the world. And that's, that's absolutely amazing, but it all came from a military necessity. Israel, from the ver Israel Space Program, from the very birth of the program, had to be able to build and launch their own satellites. And when you launch a satellite, what you want to do is you want to launch it toward the east. And the reason you want to go towards the east is you can get an extra push from the Earth's rotation and actually the momentum from the Earth's rotation helps the rocket get into orbit. Um, and this is why all countries around the world launch towards the east. Israel has a problem on the east that has neighbors that might not, might not see that as a friendly sure. uh, missile that's going over their head. So Israel launches towards the west. So this is an important part. The Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, yeah. And for that reason, they cannot build big rockets because the momentum is working against you. And this is why you build very small uh, rockets and small satellites. So this is why the miniaturization technology exists in Israel in a very unique uh, place. And we just took it to the next level and got it to the moon. Um, but I think, uh, to, to your mentioning, but when you want to get to the moon, you do need a big rocket because you need to get to a high orbit. The moon is quite far, a quarter of a million miles is, sure. is a long way to go. So we had to ship it over to Florida. Uh, where it was launched by airplane. Uh, by airplane, yeah, that was the first time. And by the way, we couldn't afford getting a full plane for ourselves, so we loaded it up with some other oranges, and we all flew uh, to to the launch site. The oranges, I think, was dropped dropped off uh, earlier uh, because I don't think Florida needs new oranges. But right, anyways, right. Uh, but uh, yeah, we got to the launch site and we got to launch it, and it was uh, spectacular. The, the the sky. It was perfect. The launch was there. perfect. Yeah. Pretty much perfect. Uh, there were some problems with the spacecraft from the very beginning. Uh, it was really interesting to see um, some thoughts, some things we didn't expect, some sensors that did not operate properly. But I think one important part of the mission is that we didn't keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of space missions have the facade of you don't hear things, you don't unless, hear things. unless unless a spaceship God forbid should blow up. You don't hear anything. You don't hear yeah. anything. So we, we thought we would do it the opposite. Uh, we kind of published everything and made videos for the public to see, and we explained about the different orbits and what's going on. And, you know, like good Israelis, everybody were arguing about it. That was great to see that Israelis were arguing how, about how we should fix the, the space modules to make them work. These Israelis have never worked in the space industry before, but they have opinions. So the space engineers at Space IL in Israel uh, were, were, were part of this. And then NASA was doing the launching for you. And uh, did you tell me something about before... Um, uh, that the rocket itself was reused? Was this a, a recycled rocket? How did that work? Yeah, so that's not NASA. That's a, a, co a private company called SpaceX. They, make, they made the launch, uh, the rocket that we actually used to get uh, into orbit. And they're a way to reduce costs is by, instead of saying that we'll build one rocket and it's going to you know, get disposed, they actually recycle the rocket and use it over and over again. So is this a rocket that separates, lands in the ocean, they go and retreat yep. and bring back? Yeah, yeah. There are beautiful videos of them landing on the ocean. Really? really wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. So this, our rocket was the third time that the same wow. rocket wow. was launched, and they recycled it again. So uh -huh. I don't know if they already used it, but uh -huh. it's, it's still uh -huh. there. So the launch took place. How, how, how did it work with orbiting the Earth? then shooting out into space towards the moon, orbiting the moon before the potential landing on the moon. How did that all work? So first thing you need to know that space is actually pretty close. If you look at it, uh, space is closer to where we're standing right now in Chicago than New York. New uh -huh. York is actually further away. Uh -huh. The only problem is you need to go up. Right. Um, so they were able to, to do this, and then we started our, our journey towards the moon. In the NASA days, the Apollo landers uh, took only three days to get to the moon, and the reason is that they chose a direct trajectory, which means that you put your, your, the moon on your, or in your eyesight, and then you fire the engine, and it gets to, uh, to the moon in a very fast manner, three and a half days. We unfortunately could not afford that because our launch was not dedicated. We had to do compromises with the other passenger about where to exact orbit that we would do. The other passenger meaning the satellite that was with you going up? Yeah, the communication satellite mm -hmm. was going up with us. And was that, was that uh, a communication satellite from Israel, from another country, or from, where was that from? No, so that was, that, that's a communication satellite that was uh, made by uh, Space Systems Floral, I think, and it was an Indonesian. Uh, Indonesian. Uh, so you actually were co collaborating with Indonesia as well by, by sharing the spaceship up. You know, you need, you need a rocket to go up, you share whatever you can. That's very nice. Uh, First, that's another historical aspect of this trip. Yeah, I think so. 
Um, so we were we were going up, and um, we we couldn't get a direct trajectory. So we started orbiting the Earth in a trajectory that would save us the cost and the ability to do this with a ride chair. And that's uh, quite unique because a lot of experts said that uh, this was never done before and they were worried that it's going to fail. So we ended up doing multiple orbits around the Earth, uh, waiting until the moon comes in the right position in the sky so we can capture it. Um, which is kind of interesting because uh, the, we couldn't control the orbit completely which because we had to do compromises. So um, we had to capture with the moon when it's a Rosh Chodesh, and a new moon. Um, and the moon was not in that position, we were wary for it, it was actually in another, another place in, the, in its revolution. So we had to wait and we had to adjust the orbit until we were able to capture with the moon in a Rosh Chodesh. And then became a different uh, problem and that is uh, in a Rosh Chodesh, in a new moon, the moon is completely dark from our side, which means the other side is completely lit. But the side that is facing us is completely dark. Right. And Except for that little sliver. Uh, yeah, it's a little sliver, and so what we wanted to do is, this is a solar-powered spacecraft, so we can't land until there's sunlight in the, in the landing site. So did you have to land on the back side of the moon where there was no, light? No, so we actually waited a, another week until the oh. moon phase changed after we captured with the moon. So it was larger. Yeah, so it was larger, larger than we could wow. see in the landing site, yeah. Very cool. And another thing I understood is that, um, uh, being that this was an Israeli project, you made sure that the project did not uh, violate Shabbat at all, that all of the work on the project as far as control and everything was done not on Shabbat. Yeah, so for the most part, I, I can't remember if maybe we had some emergency that had to Whatever, be taken but care of. But generally, that but was generally, the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we made sure the launch, they actually was, uh, there was a discussion whether the launch should be in Shabbat because the other passengers wanted it Shabbat, mm -hmm. but we got a promise that the launch was not in Shabbat and, the, uh, and it was Thursday night in, oh. uh, in Israel. And then uh, uh, the, the landing, the landing would be. Yeah, and, Wow, wow, wow. So um, how long did the actual trip until the landing process uh, started. How long was it from the time that it, it left uh, Cape Canaveral? Uh, so about two months, uh, if you time, count all the all the different trajectories that we had to do. Wow. But it was uh, almost uh, nine years of planning and building. And right, right. But still, two months is a long time to be controlling, to be watching it, to be uh, yeah. uh, making sure that you, that everything was going the way it was supposed to be going. Yeah, there was there was a, a lot of anxiety. <laughs> there was a lot of anxiety. A lot of people were holding their breath. Were, we had like uh, two satellite sitters that were every 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 time of day they man the station and make sure that everything is okay and the satellite is in good. So, place. at what point did NASA end their control or their involvement in in the in the takeoff and the and the trip? So again, it's not NASA, that's SpaceX. I'm sorry, SpaceX. Uh, yeah. I mean SpaceX. I mean SpaceX, which which is was on Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral did the launch. What, at what point did SpaceX and and their control of of the ship? So a couple of minutes in, they basically separate. We separated from the rocket itself, mm -hmm. and in that moment, we were on our own. So uh, this is where we. So happened. everything from there on was controlled in Israel. Yep. Yep. Wow. Wow. Yep. Wow. Um, tell me, uh, were there people who were? Um, hesitant to to have faith in, in in this trip that were involved in the building now normally you know you think of uh going back to nasa for a minute you think of a nasa space launch there are thousands of people involved thousands thousands how many people were involved in israel a lot in this less. project a lot less a lot less like we have a shot where you can see all the engineers in one room uh, it's not a very big less room. than 100 yes and yeah. less than 100 yeah. wow wow yeah and uh, you know NASA, you're talking about NASA. NASA did help us a lot uh, in this process. They were, uh, they had a lot of expertise about getting to the moon. Israel has never did something of that sort of yeah, getting to the actual uh, lunar orbit, and they provide us expertise and resources. And moreover, NASA has a big network it's called the Deep Space Network. These are big antennas that are used to um, communicate with missions far away that NASA mm -hmm. has on the edges of the solar system, and. Uh, what NASA did is that they were able to provide us with communication during the landing from that deep space network. Oh, wow. Which was interesting because they usually, if you're lucky and your mission is very important, you're getting one antenna pointed at you at one time. And these guys were really, go, did the extra mile and pointed not one, but two antennas on the on their sheet as it was coming down to the surface. So, as, as Bray's sheet ended its its journey to the moon and started to talk around the moon and getting ready to land on the moon. 
uh, was Prime Minister Netanyahu involved at all? Were there were there other dignitaries involved? To, because this was a historical mission. Not only was it a private mission, but it was a mission for the Jewish people, for the state of Israel, uh, to be historical. Were they all involved in this in any way, or were they uh, there at, 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 at ground control? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so actually the, the Prime Minister and the, the President were, were there at the time of the landing. The Prime Minister was in the room and the President was uh, stepping in. Um, I mean, we could have not have done it without the support of the state of Israel. There were. A lot of problems along the way, a lot of bilateral agreement between Israel and the United States that helped us and supported us in making this mission a possibility. And we're very happy that they, they chose to publicly acknowledge this is a national mission. You know, you got to remember, when we started in this bar uh, nine years ago, we were kind of lunatics. And uh, people, some of them did not think that it would work. And then we gathered enough support in the mission, especially with the help of Morris Khan and uh, uh, Iran. There was a lot of people that were involved in this. And, and Chetel Edelson, for example, was a big beneficiary. Um, but we were kind of still an outcast group, and I think the support that the President uh, uh, Rivling and President Paris before him, they gave to this project, uh, uh, I think gave it the, the volume that we were hoping for to, to be something off of Israel. Very nice, very nice. So I want to I wanna talk about just briefly uh, the landing. You got to the point of the, the space race is coming down. You took pictures from the back side of the moon. It's kind of, kind of like the historical proof that you were really there. Um, and, and, and so it was time to land and, and you were coming down and there was this module problem and stuff. But everybody looked, everything looked perfect to that point pretty much for the landing. I mean, it? I wouldn't say perfect because we had multiple problems during the, way, the landing. You got to remember, it's very easy to focus on the last couple of minutes, but this spacecraft was designed to sustain one fault. This is what we were working with, and not every fault, by the way. But it was roughly sustained, uh, programmed to sustain what one backup fault. systems ready for, for... Yeah, we didn't have backup systems for everything, but for, for the most part, uh, we had backup systems for one fault. In the end, we ended up working with not one fault, but like four or five faults in the mission. And, you know, we had the problem with the sensor at the launch, we, then we had some reset problem for, because of radiation, and we had multiple problems along the way, and to, I mean, the credit goes all to the engineers working in Israel, both from Space L and II. They fixed everything. It's you know, so give, cool. give an Israeli engineer time and they can fix everything. Um, the problem was that in this fix, basically the system became more and more complicated and it was very hard to kind of predict what's going to happen. So the last fault, you know, that was, I think, to some extent, the straw that broke the camel's back. How close were you? to a soft landing, what turned into a hard landing? How close, within minutes or within, within you know, miles, uh, if, yeah. from, from, from an American's point of view, yeah, would yeah. it be? So the spacecraft traveled for four, million, four and a half million miles uh, in this trajectory the journey, and the last failure happened in the last 10 miles. Last 10 miles. Last 10 miles. Last 10 miles. So we were talking about seconds almost. Uh, minutes, yeah. Minutes. Like two like, minutes, three oh, minutes, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah. 120 seconds, two minutes. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. Yeah. So um, um, I've seen pictures, and you can see, um, I, I guess it must be a satellite picture of the moon before, a satellite picture of the moon after the hard landing. You could see where it landed and, 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 and the place uh, where it landed. but. Um, uh, but that hard landing unfortunately destroyed most of the uh, equipment there. Tell me some things that were on the ship that are still on the moon today intact. Yeah, um, so by the way, those pictures that you were mentioning, we're talking about, uh, these are pictures that were taken by NASA, so they have uh -huh. an orbiter that can take uh, pictures mm -hmm. there. And uh, by the way, the crater that we made mm -hmm. is uh, still unnamed, I think. So uh -huh. there's the bits are off to how you want to name it. Uh -huh. um, and uh, some things that we took with us, so we took a special time capsule mm -hmm. um, that carries memories and books and, and poets and the Israeli declaration. But we also took a little bit of uh, the Bible, so the entire Bible. A Tanakh. Is, a Tanakh is over Tanakh. there. Is it, is it microfilmed? How is it, how is it on Yeah, it's a microfish kind of uh, uh, technology, but it's an uh, advanced version of it. Every letter is the size of a bacteria, so it's uh -huh. a tiny, tiny um, um, microfish and, and uh, it was made by a, an organization called the Art Mission Foundation, uh -huh. that their idea is to kind of preserve the human knowledge, so they were able to make this uh, into reality, and uh, you know, they, they think that it survived the hard landing. They think that it survived uh, the temperature. Like Ramon took a took a safer Torah, an actual safer Torah on the ship, and unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it, 
they had, they had tragedy with that. But this one had an actual Bible, a Tanakh on it. Yeah. So and that and that's still intact on the moon. They, they think so. I mean, uh, we'll need the kids uh, and the audience uh, to go check it out. Yeah. But, uh, until then. Yeah. It's so cool. So cool. What other things were on there? There was in this time capsule and things. Yeah. Like so that. there were memory memory commemorial. Um, um, uh, Holocaust survivors that were written, uh, writing some stuff memoirs. Like, memoirs uh, um, that was there. There was um, uh, entire Wikipedia in Hebrew was there. Wow. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of books and the and, Golda Meir. And you had you had um, uh, uh, magnetic testing for this for the surface of the moon planned on this and uh, cameras all over the place planned on this as well, which took a lot of pictures as it, as it was coming down, which are just amazing pictures. Um, what do you think uh, the future holds for Space IL? And do you think uh, another mission to the moon? Do you think a mission to Mars? Do you think a mission to the moon and back? What, 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 are, your, what are your dreams? So, um, so first of all, we, we, we kind of started a process to figure out what would be a good next mission to Space IL. And obviously, there are a lot of question marks about how we're going to do this and if the we're going to raise and all those things. And the but uh, we are thinking about what would be impactful for the kids because one of the key goals of this mission is to inspire kids to pursue careers in science and engineering, which is important in Israel and the United States that kids would push technology forward. And we're thinking maybe repeating the same exact mission is not going to cut it. So we're thinking about what can we do to make the kids inspired and maybe pursue careers of sciences and engineering themselves. And I think. Part of it can be doing a, a mission to Mars or a mission to the moon with more scientific experiments, with more data that we can collect. Maybe we can get a sample return mission that gets to the moon, grab some more rocks and lands um, in Israel to show uh, the rocks in Israel. But it's still it's still deb in debating, and we are hoping for opinions. So if you have a good and mission, and are are the fa the failures or the fail safes and the the uh, 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 failing of some components are those things? learning experiences which will help make the next uh, trip, the next project uh, more successful? Were those things really something that you learned from and, and, and have uh, your scientists who are working with you have ideas on how to prevent these things from happening again? Yeah, yeah. so they, they, there's a lot of lessons learned for that mission, uh, what to do and what not to do. The problem is that when you do a new mission, you fix all the lessons learned, but you don't know what, 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 what new ones will come along. Right. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. This has been so amazing. I hope that the, the pictures and the videos that we uh, shared during the show while we were talking have uh, inspired our audience. And, uh, you know, we're watched all over the world on, on the Internet and here in Chicago on television. So this is something that a lot of people may not have known about Space IL. Uh, will 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 certainly find fascinating, and those people who know about Space IL will certainly um, learn something that they didn't learn before. Yonatan, thank you thank so you much. So Yonatan Weintraub, one of the founders, one of the three founders of Space IL, the first historic private mission to the moon, which landed on the moon, and uh, never been done by a private uh, organization before. And uh, with the Google contest, did you guys win? Uh, we got a uh, like a. We got an award, a part, a part award, a uh -huh. uh, million dollars that was given to us, and that wow. entire sum is going to go towards the educational mission of Space IL. We have right. a wonderful team of volunteers that go door to door, school to school. They reach a million kids already. Doing tremendous work there. Fantastic. You want to tell my truck? Remember, stay with us. If you want to check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com, you can see this show and former shows on the web, and uh, Yasher Koach, and Mazel Tov to Israel, and to uh, uh, Yonatan and his partners, and Space IL for all they've done. Remember, if you want to email Yonatan, or you want to email me, uh, you can email us at info at tvrabbi.com. Hope to see you all next time, right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.